Paul arrived home after a busy shift and heard his child crying and his wife Helen yelling. The man sighed heavily and thought, the same thing happens every day. It's just unbearable. When will I find a good nanny for Max? The man entered the house and his son immediately ran to meet him at the door, hugged him and began to complain, wiping his tears. Hi, daddy, you finally came home. I've been waiting for you. Mommy scolded me and shouted loudly. She's mean and doesn't love me at all. Paul stroked the baby's head and quietly asked, Calm down. Don't cry, baby. What happened again? Mom would never scold you for no reason. Helen immediately approached them and replied in happily, Paul, this child leaves me no choice. Today, another nanny took her last paycheck and quit. She only worked with Max for a month. She said Max is too active and she can't cope with him. And I understand her. Max can't sit still for a second. Today he broke an expensive Chinese vase. Everything is scattered around the house. Explain to him that he shouldn't behave like that. The little boy immediately began to justify himself. It was an accident. Daddy, I didn't do it on purpose. That nanny didn't want to play with me, but only forced me to learn rhymes and letters. I asked for a break. We started playing hide and seek. She decided to hide behind the door. I could see her there. I immediately found her. And when she was coming out from behind the door, her foot caught on the table. So the vase fell. It's not my fault she's so clumsy. I even helped her pick up the pieces of the vase. But she got offended and quit for some reason. And mom was mad at me. And I didn't understand why. Paul pictured the nanny, who weighed almost 100 kilograms, trying to hide behind the door, and laughed himself. Helen looked at him incomprehensibly and said, That's what I thought. Instead of scolding our son, you are laughing like a child, and you always do that. Paul, you are not educating Max at all. No one can cope with him. But the man only replied, Honey, come on, stop yelling. I'm so tired today. I've performed three complicated surgeries, and I have a really bad headache. I don't see a problem with that. This nanny decided to quit, so we'll find a new one. You know, I think we should invite a few candidates so that Max can choose a nanny himself. Then we wouldn't have this problem anymore. He will definitely like the new nanny because he will make the choice for himself. Helen was surprised at her husband's words and said, Are you serious? Do you think a five-year-old child can choose the right nanny? Are you kidding me? I'd like to watch this show. Okay, let's go to the table for dinner. I'll contact the recruitment agents E today again and ask them to send new nannies. After dinner, Paul enjoyed playing with his son. They were making funny little faces out of plasticine and then playing taxi park. The man relaxed when he spent time with the child. It felt like he was back in his childhood again. Max always behaved perfectly with him. The baby snuggled up to him like a kitten. Paul didn't understand why Helen couldn't make friends with Max and why the nannies didn't stay in their house for more than a month. After all, Max is an ordinary child funny, active, and cheerful like all the children. Late in the evening, having put his son to bed, Paul began to embrace Helen tenderly, clinging to her with his whole body. He wanted her love and tenderness, but she turned away to the wall and said resentfully, Paul, don't touch me. I've spent several hours with your son, and I'm exhausted. I regret that I agreed to adopt this boy. Fortunately, at least I don't have my own children. Otherwise, I'd go crazy. Paul stopped her abruptly. Don't you ever say that again. I love Max, he is my son now. I've always dreamed of having children. Children bring happiness, but you still can't understand that. Good night, Helen. Paul got nervous and couldn't sleep anymore. He was lying in bed, thinking about his past. Paul dreamed of becoming a doctor from childhood. He grew up in a family of doctors, so he was often in the hospital and saw this profession from the inside. The boy saw how doctors save patients, help them get back on their feet, and wanted to do it too. He entered medical university, studied with honors, and met Lindsay there. 
The girl was shy, modest, and very beautiful. She grew up in a poor family, studied to be a nurse in college, and worked part-time at the university as a lab technician. Paul immediately fell in love with her, started helping her carry heavy bread boards and clean up the lab, and so they began to communicate, became friends, and then started dating. They had such a sincere relationship, such a tender love, that everyone who knew them had no doubt that their wedding would be very soon. Paul's parents were not happy with such a poor fiancé, but they didn't try to break them up, realizing that their son was in love and would not listen to their advice. When the wedding was already scheduled, Paul unexpectedly left for an internship in another city. There was a huge cardiac surgery center there with the best professionals in the country. The couple couldn't say goodbye for a long time. They couldn't stop hugging each other. Lindsay looked into her fiancé's eyes and whispered, I'll be waiting for you, Paul. Call me every day. Okay, three months will go by very quickly. Paul kissed his fiancé and said, Of course, my love, as soon as I get back, we'll get married. Paul worked very hard and called Lindsay every night. But after a month she stopped answering. Her phone was off all the time. The guy was worried and asked his mom to go and find out what happened to Lindsay. His parents promised to find out, but after a while, there was no result. The boy felt anxious. When he returned home, his parents told him the terrible news that Lindsay had gone to another city and died in a car accident. Paul sank into depression. It seemed to him that his life was over. How could this be? They were going to get married. He wanted to find out everything, wanted to go to her grave, to say goodbye to his fiancée, but his parents dissuaded him. Paul, you don't have to go there. Lindsay's not from this city. You don't even know her home address. She's probably buried in her hometown. You'll spend a lot of time going there. And then what? You'll stop studying and working, and you'll ruin your life. It's not your fault that the accident happened. You can't save her. Probably it was her fate. We found out about the tragedy by accident. From the TV news. You need to go on with your life. Work. Succeed. And overcome this phase of life. And Paul accepted this tragedy. He began to work hard. And over the years he became a successful surgeon. Patients came to him from other cities. And even countries. But things weren't going well with his personal life. His parents had already died, and he was already in his 40s, but he was still single. He had short-term romances, but he could not find a girl like Lindsay. She was the only one who had occupied his heart for years. But five years ago, Paul attended a presentation on innovative medical equipment, where he met Helen, a young journalist. She was the first to talk to him, recognized who he was, and even wanted to interview him. That's how they met. And then Helen unexpectedly came to his house and asked for help in dealing with the specifics of a medical text. Paul gladly agreed, but his eyes were focused on her deep neck line, and he wanted to touch her long, beautiful legs, which were barely covered by the short dress. They had dinner together, had some wine, and unexpectedly woke up together. Paul felt awkward in the morning, blaming himself realizing that he'd had too much wine last night and crossed the line. He thought Helen would be offended, but she only laughed merrily and said, Well, Paul, now you have to marry me after such a passionate night. She started kissing him passionately again, and he, enjoying these feelings, suddenly thought, Why not? Helen is young, smart, and attractive. She's the perfect candidate to be a famous surgeon's wife. So they began to live together. They understood each other without words, and their nights were passionate. But there was something that upset Paul. Helen didn't want to hear anything about children. She was busy with her career and herself. Her body and her appearance were more important to her than children. She carefully monitored her weight and refused to talk about pregnancy. Helen was fine with everything. Now she was not just an aspiring journalist, but the wife of a famous surgeon. It greatly expanded her opportunities. Now people looked at her in a completely different way. She didn't need children at all. But one day, 
A tragedy happened in the hospital where Paul worked. A young woman died during childbirth. The case was very complicated. Her baby was orphaned. He had no relatives. And by law, he had to be transferred to an orphanage. Paul heard this story from the nurses. He couldn't stop thinking about this baby. So he decided to go to the pediatrics department himself and look at him. He didn't know why he needed it, but his emotions were stronger than he was. He couldn't stop thinking about this orphan boy. The baby was lying in the neonatal intensive care unit. He was tiny. His arms were very thin and his skin was almost transparent. All the blood vessels on his face were visible. The pediatric nurse was worried. I feel so sorry for this baby. He is weak, we saved him, but he is not gaining weight, as if he feels that his mom is gone. It will be hard for him without his mom's affection and care. Paul opened the Niku and stroked the infant's tiny hand, said something to him affectionately, and the baby opened his eyes, looked at the doctor, and seemed to smile at him. It was impossible it was too early for the baby to smile, but even the shock nurse noticed it. The surgeon suddenly realized that he could not allow this tiny baby boy to end up in an orphanage. He confidently decided to adopt him, especially since he had been dreaming of children for a long time, and he was no longer young. Paul was sure that Helen would be against it because she made it clear that she didn't want to have children. But he was wrong. The woman even rejoiced at the news. You're right, honey. This boy's fate is so tough. We can really save him. Let's adopt him. But I won't tend my career. We'll hire a good nanny. Okay. But in general, I don't mind. You've wanted a baby for a long time. This is your chance. So Max became the son of a surgeon. Paul gave him his last name. And the boy didn't even realize he was adopted. The boy adored his father, but the child had a bad relationship with Helen. He felt her indifference. She didn't want to spend time with him, and even if she paid her attention to the boy, it was only when her husband was at home. Otherwise, the nanny took care of the child. While Max was a baby, they had a good nanny. She was an elderly lady, and she knew how to deal with babies. The boy was always clean, fed, and never cried. But when Max started to work, the nanny couldn't cope with him anymore, and she had to quit. Since then, the nannies changed very often, not staying long in the house. Some of them were very young girls who were focused on their smartphones and didn't care about the child, and others were elderly and clumsy women who couldn't cope with Max. So today another nanny decided to quit. Paul couldn't quit his job, because his job was the main source of income for their family. And Helen didn't even want to hear anything about quitting her job and taking care of Max. She never developed a maternal instinct. She would only occasionally take Max in her arms and cuddle him when Paul looked at them. She wanted Max to sit quietly in the corner drawing something or playing, not bothering her. Helen even gave him a cool tablet with games on it, hoping that now the child would stop running around the house and bothering her. But Paul was against such games. He believed that playing games on the tablet slowed down the child's development. He was glad that Max was not interested in the tablet, but preferred playing in the yard, drying, and sports. All in all, he had to find a new nanny again. On Saturday, three candidates came in for an interview. Paul was sitting in his office reading their CVs, while Max was playing railroad and looking at the women. Helen took a seat on the huge couch and prepared to watch a fascinating show as the five-year-old child would choose a nanny for himself. She was sure this idea was stupid but was curious to see where it would lead. The first candidate worked into the office. It was a stern-looking lady in glasses in her early fifties. She had a perfect CV. She was fluent in three languages and was a former teacher. Paul said hello and said, Your experience is impressive, but we have an unusual case. I would like you to talk to my son, and if he likes you, I will hire you." The lady frowned and approached Max, but as soon as she spoke to the child, he immediately ran to his father and hid behind his back. It was clear that this nanny was not the right one for them. The second candidate also wasn't right. There was one last candidate, a nice young girl, about 20 years old, 
walked into the office. Paul sighed and thought to himself that she wouldn't be suitable for the job either. But to his great surprise, she immediately found a common language with the boy the girl spoke to him tenderly and calmly, and they almost immediately began to play railroad together. Nanny was the conductor, and Max was the driver of the train. The son smiled, relaxed, and said, Daddy, I picked a nanny. I want Lily to work for us. I promise I'll obey her. Paul exhaled and called Lily over to the table to draw up the contract. It was only now that he noticed the pen around her neck. He turned pale, leaned back in his chair, took off his glasses, and began rubbing his eyes. The frightened girl asked, Excuse me, is something wrong? Don't worry about my young age. I love children very much, and I will work diligently. Max is a good boy. I'm sure we'll make friends. The wife got nervous on the couch, too she saw her husband's strange reaction. But she got it all wrong. She thought that Paul liked this young girl. That's why he was so confused. Paul immediately calmed down and replied, No, it's all right. It's just a headache. Probably magnetic storms. You are hired. Give me your passport. We'll draw up a contract. You can start tomorrow. Your working day starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. The most important thing for me is that Max is satisfied. When Lily left, Helen bombarded her husband with questions. Honey, what's going on? The previous nanny was a professional. She could have taught Max to speak different languages. But you turned her down and chose this inexperienced young girl. Tell me, what can she teach Max? Why did you look at her so strangely? Did you like her as a woman? Tell me the truth. I'm jealous. The man laughed, picked Helen up in his arms, and pulled her close to him. Helen, I'm glad you are jealous, but you're wrong. Lily is an ordinary girl. There's nothing special about her. I just really had a headache. Probably it was a vasospasm. I even felt sick. I only love you. Don't make things up. Max was the one who chose her, let's keep it that way. Besides, it's better for you. The child won't bother you during the day. Isn't that what you dreamed of? Helen pressed her plump lips together and remained silent, but still decided to be more vigilant. She didn't like this young girl, and she decided to get rid of her as soon as possible. She didn't want a competitor in the house. Paul decided to go for a work with his son, and they went to the park. The boy was playing with other kids, rolling down the slide, climbing the rope park, and jumping on trampolines. And the man was sitting on a bench, thinking only about one thing. Where did Lily get the pennant? It was definitely Lindsay's pennant. It was engraved, made of an expensive stone, and custom made. There couldn't be a second one like it. It was the pennant he had once given to his fiancée for her birthday. The girl never took it off. It was a symbol of their love. What if Lily is his daughter? Probably not, but he needed to check it out somehow. After all, years ago, he was confused. He was in grief and didn't find the strength to look for the grave of his beloved. What if she wasn't dead? Or was she pregnant when the accident happened? There were many questions in his mind, but no answers. The man decided to ask Lily about her parents and about her childhood. It had been three months since the girl started working at the surgeon's house. Max obeyed her, and they even became friends. But the most important thing was that Lily didn't try to be a strict educator. On the contrary, she was Max's friend. The nanny tried to understand him, didn't yell at him, and if he started to misbehave, she calmly explained to him why it was bad and why he shouldn't do that, and the boy understood everything. Lily enjoyed playing ball with him in the yard and had time to play hide and seek and learn tomb twisters. Paul was very pleased. Now his son didn't meet him in tears. On the contrary, every evening he told him how was his day and boasted of his successes. It was obvious that the child was comfortable with his new nanny. Helen was angry. She was jealous it seemed to her that Lily had come to their house to take her husband and son away from her. She often scolded Lily for no reason and was unnecessarily strict with her. 
but the girl was always polite and calm. She didn't react to her silly comments and always managed not to complicate the situation. It pissed Helen off even more. She didn't know how to get rid of this nanny. And then she developed a cunning plan. Paul was trying to talk to Lily all this time, but as soon as he started the conversation, his wife immediately showed up and looked at them very suspiciously. The girl mentioned that her mother had died a long time ago, and this news proved Paul's assumptions. The man didn't dare to ask about the pen directly, but the more he looked closely at the new nanny, the more he became convinced that Lily looked a lot like Lindsay. The same long neck, blue eyes, and golden curls, even the ringing, cheerful laugh reminded him of his first and strongest love. The girl felt a little embarrassed when she saw his long intent gaze in her direction. Paul couldn't stand it and decided to check if he and Lily were related or not. The idea never left his mind. One day, he found the girl's hairpin that she had left on the table in the nursery. It had some hair on it. The man carefully removed the hair and put it in a plastic bag, deciding to make a genetic test. At the same moment, his wife entered the room. Of course, she saw it, but she didn't make a scandal this time and only looked at her husband suspiciously. He deliberately took the hairpin in his hands and said out loud, the nanny left a hairpin on the table. We have to give it back to her tomorrow. It's a very interesting accessory. It seems simple, but it's very beautiful. The woman said resentfully, nothing special, a very cheap thing, just like this girl. All she thinks about is how to make you fall in love with her. Do you think I don't notice anything? Paul could hardly contain his irritation. He hugged his wife and said, Don't be silly, Helen. Lily has made friends with our son. No one has ever been able to do that before. Not even you. What's wrong with you again? Let's not fight. Instead, let's go get some coffee. And then I'll give you a relaxing massage. His wife pretended not to be mad at her husband, but she started to hate this nanny even more. There were a thousand thoughts in her head. What is going on? Maybe she's not just a nanny who seduces him. Maybe this child isn't just an orphan, but his real son. She managed to make friends with this child too quickly. I don't know what's going on, but I have to get rid of that witch. Helen decided and started implementing her wicked plan. It was an ordinary weekday. Lily and Max took a long work in the park. The weather was fine. Then they learned a verse, and in the afternoon, they were making animals out of plasticine, having fun. But the parents had already returned, and it was time for the nanny to go home. Helen went to her room to change her clothes, but suddenly she ran out of there and started shouting like crazy. Paul, come here, now. My jewelry box is missing. There's a lot of expensive jewelry and my diamond earrings. The man ran out into the living room and began to calm his wife. Honey, don't scream. Your jewelry box couldn't have gone missing. There are no thieves in our house. Maybe you put it somewhere else and forgot about it. Why panic? Let's just try to find it. Lily also came out into the hallway and asked worriedly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to go home now. Is something wrong? Helen screamed even louder. So there she is, the thief. I bet this modest girl is the one who stole my jewelry. Quickly show me your bag and pockets. Lily was shocked by such words. She felt so offended. After all, she had never stolen anything from anyone. Why was she being humiliated here? She silently opened her bag and emptied the contents onto the carpet in the hallway. But everyone was horrified. The jewelry box that Helen was looking for had fallen out of the nanny's bag. Lily cried and tried to justify herself. I didn't take anything. I swear. I don't know how it got in the bag. But Helen was unstoppable, screaming like a mad woman. Paul, look at that insolent nanny. You brought a criminal into our house. She stole jewelry and won't plead guilty. Go away. You are fired or I'll call the police and you'll end up in jail. The nanny covered her face with her hands and ran out of the mansion. She ran without seeing the road and cried with resentment and injustice. Paul was shocked at what had happened in his house. 
He could not believe that Lily was really a thief. She was not that kind of person, but there was evidence the box was really in her bag, and she hurried home as soon as she heard about jail. The man's first thought was to catch up with the nanny and talk about it calmly, but he stopped himself from doing so. His wife still couldn't calm down, continuing to dishonor Lily's reputation, and Paul was sitting on the couch in confusion. But little Max kept tugging on his arm saying, Daddy, I have a secret to tell you. It's very urgent. But the man paid no attention. Max, dear, I have no time. Go to your room, draw, play. Adults need to solve the problem. A week later, they still hadn't found a new nanny for Max. So Paul had to take a vacation to babysit his son. Max was always sad, refused to eat and go outside but just sat by the window and waited for someone. But Helen was happy finally. There was no this annoying girl in the house. No more competitors. Paul could not calm down because the results of the genetic test surprised him. He and Lily are not relatives, but he was sure that she was his biological daughter. The man kept thinking, this is very strange. Where did Lily get this pendant? Why does she look so much like Lindsay? my first and only love. I was so happy. I was sure I found my daughter. But the DNA test can't be wrong. It was late in the evening. Helen came home drunk. The newspaper office was celebrating a successful deal with an entrepreneur. The article was excellent, and she got a good bonus. She looked sadly at Paul, who was upset for the second week, and then took a shower and went to the bedroom. Paul noticed the light on in the nursery, and didn't understand why Max was awake. He silently peeked into his room and saw that the boy was sitting at the table and was focused on drying something. The man approached the kid. He was curious about what was in the drying and why his son was still awake. There was a girl with a long braid and dozens of arrows were hitting her. There were black clouds and thunderbolts in the sky. Paul was frightened and cautiously asked Max about it. Max. Who's that in the drying? And why are you up so late? Did you have a nightmare? The boy looked seriously at his father and answered, It is Lily. She is hurt, for she is not a thief. She is crying now, and I miss her a lot. Paul asked worriedly, What makes you think she's not a thief? Mummy's jewelry box was in her bag. So Lily took it from the table without asking. Right, Max suddenly crumpled up the piece of paper and cried. No, it's not true. I saw everything. Mom put the box in her bag, and then she yelled at her and kicked her out. I wanted to tell you everything right away, but you wouldn't listen to me. That's not fair. Why did Mom do that to the nanny? Lily is kind. She's nice, and I miss her very much. I don't want another nanny. Let her come back to our house, please. The child started crying loudly. It was clear that this had been bothering him all day. He couldn't accept such an injustice, and it was clear that he was telling the truth. Paul was shocked. Could Helen really do that? He decided to talk to her immediately. He hugged Max and said, I promise I'll figure everything out. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you before. Go to sleep. Everything will be okay. I promise. The little boy cheered up a little and went to sleep. Paul read him a bedtime story, and Max fell asleep. After that, the man went to the bedroom, closed the door tightly, and started an unpleasant conversation. I know the truth. You slipped the box into Lily's bag. You accused a good person of stealing it, and humiliated her. Immediately apologize and explain your cruel act. The wife didn't even think of apologizing. On the contrary, she started yelling. Did Max tell you the truth? Yes, I did it, and I don't regret it. What did you expect? You took this young girl to our house and constantly showed her signs of attention. Do you think I should have tolerated it? I'm sick and tired of it all. First, you decided to adopt a child without asking my opinion. And then you hired a young girl. You didn't even discuss it with me. Tell me, why should I like someone else's child? Yes, Max is a nice boy, an orphan, 
I understand, but he's not my child. I didn't even want to have my own kids, and you're offering to raise someone else's kids. And I don't want to see this nanny in our house. Do you understand? Paul didn't expect such revelations, and answered his wife harshly. So why do we live together then? Answer me. Maybe we'd better get a divorce. I can't imagine my life without Max, he is my child. And Lily is just a nice girl. You had no right to do that to her. I'm ashamed of what you did. I was wrong again. You and I are completely different people. Helen turned red with anger and told her husband, fine, I'll leave you tomorrow. Raise your adopted child yourself and you can bring the girl back to the house if she is so wonderful. And I'm a young attractive woman. Wealthy entrepreneurs have been paying attention to me for a long time. I don't want that kind of family life. I don't want to read bedtime stories and make soup. I'm sick of it. I deserve better. I thought we'd enjoy our life. Go to the resorts. To the music concerts. But you forced me to raise an orphan. Goodbye, Paul. We won't live together anymore. In the morning Helen left, slamming the door loudly. Paul was worried that Max would suffer because of their divorce because he considered Helen his mom. He tried to explain to Max that his mom was going to another country on a business trip for a long time because she had a special job. The couple divorced without problems because they had no children together and they did not have to divide their property. Everything had been purchased before the marriage. Paul decided to find Lily and apologize and at the same time to ask about her pendant. But it was not that easy. The recruitment agency told him that she had quit after the scandal. It turned out that Helen called the agency and told them that Lily had stolen her jewelry. A girl with such a reputation would definitely not be able to continue working as a nanny. Paul clutched his head and started explaining everything to the manager. I'm so sorry. It was my wife who put the box in her bag and accused the nanny. She was jealous of her for some reason. The girl didn't steal anything. I'm so ashamed. I beg you give me her home address. I need to talk to her and apologize. And my son misses Lily. And he wants her back in the family. I realize that you don't have to give me her address. But please help me. It's not the girl's fault. I have to apologize. The manager turned out to be a smart woman and was happy to get this phone call. I'm glad that we figured everything out. You know, I've seen a lot of different people, and I was sure that Lily couldn't be a thief. She's a very kind and honest girl. I didn't want her to quit, but your wife yelled at her so much that Lily got angry and quit herself. If you happen to see her, tell her to come back to the agency. I'd be happy to hire her back. Paul drove to the given address, and on the way, he wondered how it had happened that he had lived for five years with such a horrible person as Helen. What had he hoped for? On the way, Paul bought a bouquet of roses and was standing at the door for a long time, hesitating to press the bell. But when he saw a bewildered Lily on the threshold, he resolutely held out the bouquet and said, I came to apologize. I'm sorry, Lily, you didn't steal anything. It was my wife who set it all up. I need to explain everything to you. The girl agreed and said quietly, wait for me outside. Please. I'm sorry. I can't invite you into my apartment. I have a sick relative there. A few minutes later, Lily came outside and they sat down on a bench. The man was very nervous. He was explaining everything slowly, apologizing, saying that he had already explained everything in the agency and that Max was waiting for her very much. Lily exhaled and said, I'm really glad to hear that it makes me feel so much better. I used to cry at night. I couldn't bear the injustice. I would love to work with Max again. You have a wonderful son. But I'm afraid your wife won't like it. She'll be against it. And I'm afraid to see her again. Paul smiled and said, Helen and I are already divorced. So no one will mind. Can I ask you a personal question? It's been on my mind since I first saw you. I ordered this pendant years ago. There is no second one like it in the whole world. I gave it to my beloved woman when I was young. Lily replied in surprise. My aunt Lindsay gave it to me. You know, 
I'm an orphan. My mother died when I was 15. And I have no one else except my aunt. So she adopted me. I am very grateful to her for everything. But six months ago she fell in the street and hit her back. My aunt injured her spine and didn't go to the hospital on time. And now the pain is unbearable. She is sick and she can't even get out of bed. Doctors say that we have lost a lot of time we should have gone to the hospital earlier. Surgery can be done, but it is very expensive, and they do not guarantee a good result. My aunt is in depression. She doesn't want to live, and I feel so sorry for her. I want to help her so much. So I got a job as a nanny. I thought I could save money for her treatment. I want to cry when I see that she is dying slowly. I have already applied to charity funds for help, but the fundraising is a very slow process, and she is getting worse. Painkillers are not helping anymore. So she recently put her pen around my neck. My aunt never parted with it. She asked me not to take it off after her death, and not to sell it. It's very important to her, and I don't even want to think about her death. My aunt is still young. I can't let her die. Lily couldn't stand it and cried in despair. Lily, why didn't you tell me this before? I'm a surgeon. Let's go inside. I have to examine your aunt and check her test results. If it's possible to save her, I'll do it. And don't worry, you won't have to pay for the surgery. Lily quickly led him to the apartment. She couldn't miss this opportunity because she had already tried everything available to her. When Paul entered, he immediately smelled the specific odor of various medications. Muffled moans sounded from the bedroom. They entered the room together. A skinny, exhausted woman was lying on the bed. Her long tangled hair was on the pillow, and she was clutching the blanket in her fist and moaning quietly, struggling with the unbearable pain. Paul was shocked. He looked at the features of her face and realized that it was Lindsay. His Lindsay his first and strongest love. His heart ached. It was impossible to look at the suffering of the poor woman without tears. Lily was talking to her affectionately. Auntie, you have to be patient. They can give you an injection only in an hour. I've asked the doctor to examine you. The doctor is Max's father. I told you about him. He's a surgeon. Can he examine you? Maybe he can help you. I'll leave the room while he examines you. But if you need my help, I'm in the hallway. Paul hurried to the bedside, took the woman's thin, cold hand, and whispered, Lindsay, my love, I have found you. I can't believe my happiness. They told me then that you died in an accident. I've been mourning you for a long time. Do you recognize me? It's me, Paul, your Paul. We were going to get married. Do you remember? The woman looked at him in shock and even managed to smile for a moment and whispered. Of course, I remember you, Paul. I never stopped loving you, but now I'm in so much pain. I'd rather die back then than be in so much pain now. But I'm glad I saw you before I die. I'm gonna die soon. I can feel it. The only thing I worry about is that Lily has no one she'll be left all alone. Paul, I want you to know that you're the only one I've ever loved. I'm in so much pain. The woman said gravely, Lindsay groaned with pain again, and Paul realized that he was not just her ex-fiancé, but a surgeon, and began to examine her, then filled a prescription and sent Lily to the drugstore, giving her money for the medicine, who prescribed her this medicine. It's only making her feel worse. Lily, hurry up, go to the drugstore and get the right medicine. It should help and I'll check all the tests. He examined everything, frowned for a long time, silently stroked Lindsay's arm, and then said decisively, Lindsay, it's too early for you to think about death. I don't want to hear anything about it anymore. The situation is very difficult, but we will fight for your health. I will perform the surgery, and I will make sure you don't suffer any pain. Lindsay, I still love you. Trust me. We have everything ahead of us. I beg you, trust me. Tears were streaming down the woman's face. She looked at Paul and hope appeared in her eyes. She whispered with dry lips. I trust you, Paul. 
I trust you. The man immediately called the head of the department and scheduled an urgent operation. They lost a lot of time they had to hurry while Lindsay was still able to feel pain. The surgeon was focused and told Lily what to do. The girl packed all the medical certificates, documents, and some clothes. She prayed and cried, worrying about how the operation would go. Paul realized that the life and health of his beloved woman depended only on him, and he had to do everything possible so that she could walk again. He had no right to make a mistake. Lindsay could not believe that all this was happening to her. All her life she had loved only Paul, and after their breakup, she never fell in love with anyone else. She had never expected to see him again, and now, when she was bedridden, his appearance was like a miracle. Lindsay was carried on a gurney to the operating room, and Paul was holding her hand. She was not afraid of dying during the surgery. She only smiled blissfully, trying to memorize every feature of his face. The surgery lasted more than five hours. Paul was literally reassembling the nerves of her spine one millimeter by another. He was sweating, but he stayed focused and kept doing his job. Finally, the operation was over. The surgeon had no energy left, but he was pleased with the result. The health prognosis for Lindsay was good, but the man didn't even think of going to rest. He changed into a dry uniform and stayed at the patient's bedside in the intensive care unit. It was important to him that she saw him as soon as she opened her eyes. Lindsay didn't regain consciousness for a long time. She woke up, didn't understand anything, and quickly fell asleep again. But 24 hours later, she finally woke up. She looked around the room and saw Paul dozing in a chair beside her. He never let go of her hand, holding it tightly. It felt so warm, so good. And she thought, I hope it's not just a dream. Did my prayers help? My beloved Paul is by my side, and he's holding my hand. It's not a dream, it's reality. When she was able to move her hand, Paul immediately woke up and looked at her anxiously. He began stroking her hair and hands and whispering, Lindsay, my love, the surgery was successful. I'm sure everything will be fine now. You'll be fine. How are you feeling? Are you feeling nauseous? I'll wet your lips now, and you'll feel better. He nursed her like a child, and shared with her everything that had happened during these years of separation. Lindsay, my love, why did you disappear then? I called you a million times, but you didn't pick up the phone. I felt that something bad happened to you. And then my parents told me this terrible news. Can you imagine what I went through? I thought I would go crazy. I thought I wouldn't survive. I mourned you like you were dead. Please, tell me, what really happened? It's all in the past now. No grudges. I just want to know the truth. It's very important to me, you know. The woman removed her hair from her face, swallowed her tears, and began to tell quietly. I didn't run away, Paul. I loved you madly. We dreamed of getting married. We even chose names for our future children. We were so naive. But after you left, your parents came to me. They intimidated and blackmailed me. They demanded that we break up. I said no. But then your father found out that my mom had a criminal record and started threatening that he would tell her employer about it and she'll be fired and she'll never get another job. I was really scared, but I agreed. I couldn't do that to my mom. You know, you have no idea how hard it was for me to make this decision realizing that I would never see you again. It was unbearably painful. I was pregnant at the time, but due to severe stress, I had a miscarriage. My life was completely destroyed. I even wanted to go to a convent to become a nun. I spent a month there and prayed a lot. The nuns had long conversations with me and talked me out of such a life, saying that I was not ready for it. I remembered her words for the rest of my life. Go with God. Live honestly. Don't hold grudges against people. And don't forget to do good to people. Pray. And if God helps, you will meet Paul again. That's how I decided to become a volunteer. Helping homeless animals. And finding new homes for them. When my sister died, I adopted Lily. 
She is a good girl, kind and sympathetic. So we began to live together. And over the years, she became like a daughter to me. And I never forgot about you, Paul. I tried dating men, but I could never fall in love again, which is why I never got married. All my life I took care of my niece and stray animals. When I stopped working, I was afraid for Lily. I thought I would die soon. That's why I gave her your pendant. I never took it off my neck all my life. I kept it with me. When I saw you in my room, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was asleep. Paul, you have no idea how much I love you. The man kissed every finger on her hand. He couldn't stop looking into her sincere eyes and begged for forgiveness. Lindsay, forgive me. I'm a coward. I don't understand why I didn't even try to find your grave when my parents told me you died. I should have found out what really happened to you. I'm sure I would have found you then. But I decided to stay at home like a coward. My dear, sweetheart, you suffered so much while we were apart. I studied, worked, became a chief surgeon in our city, finished my dissertation, got married, and already divorced recently. I adopted a child, and now I'm raising him alone. And I suffered all my life, trying to find a woman like you, but I couldn't. There was passion, lust, and romance in my life, but there was no love. I will never let you go now. I want you to become a healthy and happy woman again. As before, I'll do anything to make that happen. You know, sweetheart, I think it's no accident that you and I met again. He told Lindsay everything about his quarrels with his wife, about the genetic test, and about the pen that had helped him find her. Well, Lindsay said in surprise. After a while, the woman began to recover. Lindsay had a long rehabilitation ahead of her. And finally, she managed to get back on her feet. She was still walking on crutches, but she was happy about it anyway. Paul was by her side all the time, and Lily helped him with Max. She was his babysitter, just like before. Paul and Lindsay moved into the mansion and began living together, raising Max. The boy quickly made friends with the woman. He felt she loved him and cared for him. Lily also lived with them. She met a nice guy when she visited her aunt in the hospital. Her fiancé worked as a nurse. He was a kind and sincere guy. Lindsay was happy for her niece. She saw that the guy sincerely loved Lily, and the girl's smile never faded from her face. Paul and Lindsay lived together as if there were no years of separation between them. A woman looked better and younger when she was with a loving man. Her face glowed with blush, and her eyes glowed with love as in her youth. Now Lindsay knew for sure that it was possible to start a new life even in your 40s. She enjoyed the nights of pleasure when her lover whispered words of love in her ear and hugged her so tightly as if she was the most precious treasure in his life. The woman devoted all her free time to Max, playing with the boy and having fun. Her long-time dream had come true, she had become a mom. Max didn't think about Helen anymore because he was enveloped in the care of Lindsay, Lily, and Daddy. And now there was no yelling or scandals in their family but always laughter and fun. Lindsay turned out to be a great housewife. She made delicious soups and pastries, and Paul always hurried home after work, knowing that she loved and waited for him there. Lindsay continued to be involved in charity work, and now she was looking for new homes for cats and dogs together with Max. And at the same time, she was teaching the little boy to love and help animals. The boy brought home an abandoned, sick cat and persuaded his father to keep that cat at home. They nursed him together, fed him, and bought him vitamins and medicines. Soon, he turned into a beautiful cat with long shiny fur, and he was very grateful to his new family for saving him. A year later, Max went to school. Lindsay and Paul walked him to school holding his hands, and they looked like a real family and were very proud of their son. But one day, when the family was having dinner, the doorbell rang, and Paul went to open the door. He was surprised to see Helen on the doorstep. She hadn't changed at all. She was wearing a gorgeous dress, high heels, and bright lipstick, and she had the same piercing journalist's guise. The man frowned and said, Hello, 
I can't say I'm glad to see you. Why did you come? Don't tell me you missed me. I wouldn't believe you anyway. Helen pretended to smile sincerely and replied, Honestly, I didn't think our meeting would be like this. I really missed you, my love, and I missed our son Max. And I also wanted to ask you for some money. Just a few thousand dollars. I failed to be a popular journalist in the big city. Here your friends offered me to do the best reporting, but there I'm just a nobody. A young guy ran away from me as soon as I ran out of money. So, would you be willing to help me? Paul was shocked at such brazenness and answered sharply, I won't give you any money, not a dime. You are no longer part of my life. Now I have a strong, real family, and I am happy. I wish you to create a family too. We broke up long ago, and now we're just strangers to each other. You said you are bored with me, and you don't like kids, right? I'm sorry, Helen. I won't invite you into the house. There's no need for that. Goodbye. The woman squinted her eyes, pressed her lips together, and said, looking at him, what if I tell Max that he's adopted? Do you think he'd be upset? He thinks you're his real father. So, are you gonna give me the money? Think twice. Paul, the man got angry and shouted, Are you trying to blackmail me? Go away. It's disgusting. The woman grinned and left saying, Paul, I think you're going to regret this. When Max went to bed, Paul told Lindsay and Lily about everything. Deeply worried about the boy. Do you think Helen will tell Max the truth? I'm so scared because he's still a little boy and I don't know how he'll take the news. I'm afraid of traumatizing his childish mental health. Lindsay thought for a moment, but then answered, Paul, we can't hide this from our son for the rest of his life. It's not right. If Helen doesn't tell him the truth, other people will. The sooner Max knows the truth, the easier he'll accept it. When we tell him the truth, we no longer have to be afraid of blackmailers. Lily suddenly suggested, Can I try to explain it to him myself the next time we play? I hope I'll be able to do that. After all, I'm studying to be a psychologist, and I know that children perceive everything differently than adults. We don't need to tell them everything all at once. We need to explain it to them little by little. You know, Paul agreed, even though he was very worried. But there was no other way out. Otherwise, Helen would realize she could manipulate him and would demand money all the time. Lily fulfilled her promise. She had a long conversation with the boy. Then they drew something together, and an hour later the boy climbed on his father's lap, cuddled up to him, and said calmly, You are my daddy anyway. You are the most dear, and I love you very much. Paul could not hold back his emotions, tears flowed from his eyes and he felt so much warmth in his heart. He hugged his son and answered looking into his eyes, You are my beloved and dear son, and I will never betray you. I will always be by your side, no matter what. Do you understand, Max? The boy nodded and clung tighter to his father. They had long ago become a real family, not by blood, but by destiny. Helen still decided to take revenge on her ex-husband and met their family when they were working with Max in the park after school. The boy was laughing merrily, Paul was playing with him, and Lindsay was looking at her boys with a smile. And then Helen walked up to them and clapped her hands together. What a model family. Dad, Mom and Son. Hi Max. Do you remember me? You called me Mom a year ago, didn't you? Did you know that your dad is not your real dad? You're adopted. You are not his son. You are just a stranger. They are not your real parents. They don't need you. Paul clenched his fists with anger and wanted to defend his son. But Max was ahead of him and answered calmly. I know that my biological mom died and my dad adopted me. He is the dearest person to me. And he loves me. And so does Lindsay. And you are mean. You never loved me. Go away. Paul smiled took his son in his arms and whispered, I knew my son was the smartest boy. I'm proud of you, Max. We are a real family and there should be no evil people around us. So, shall we go home for lunch? Max took Daddy and Lindsay by their hands 
and the three of them worked home. Helen was standing there, humiliated and angry at the child. Her plan failed. She got no money and was left with nothing. Lonely and pathetic, Paul has changed so much. He's calm, confident, and he really loves this woman. I don't understand why he's so attracted to her. I was so stupid. I lost this wonderful man and ruined my own family. All that arrogance and hypocrisy was unnecessary. In fact, now Helen was just a poor lonely woman. Her short-term love affairs didn't bring her any joy. Things weren't good at work either. And she was the one to blame for that. Lindsay was not feeling well again. She was nervous. She was not sleeping well. And her menstrual cycle was completely messed up. Paul became concerned about her health and urged her to see a doctor. But Lindsay only said, Paul, everything is fine. I'm already in my 40s, so menopause is probably about to happen. That's why I feel dizzy. I think everything will be better soon. But after two months, Lindsay didn't feel any better. So Paul took her to a gynecologist, explained the situation to the doctor, and stayed waiting outside the door. A few minutes later, a crying Lindsay and the doctor came out. Her husband was frightened and began to ask questions. Is everything really bad? Isn't it just menopause? Is it something serious? Menopause. What are you talking about? No, your wife is 13 weeks pregnant. The doctor explained. Paul sat back in his chair and covered his head with his hands. He couldn't believe what he had just heard. Lindsay was pregnant. They were going to have a baby. She was crying too and whispered, hugging Paul. I can't believe it. After that miscarriage in my youth, I never got pregnant and I never thought it could happen again. It's really a blessing, even if it's very late.